शांतिरंतरिक्षगम शांतिर द्यावशांतिर दिशाशांतिरावांतर दिशाव शांतिरक्षनिशांतिर वायुशांतिरादित्यशांतिशंद्रमा शांतिर नक्षत्रानिशांतिराप Shanti Roshadaya Shanti Vanaspataya Shanti Gau Shanti Raja Shanti Rashva Shanti Purusha Shanti Brahma Shanti Brahmana Shanti Shanti Reva Shanti Shanti Rame Astu Shanti Hi. May there be peace on earth and in the sky. May there be peace in the water and in all directions. May there be peace in the plants, in the trees and in animals. May there be peace in the hearts of all beings. May there be peace in everyone and in everything. Sarvetra Sukhina Santo Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makas Chitukha Bhag Bhavet Sarvas Taratu Durgani Sarvo Bhadrani Pashyatu Sarvas Sad Buddhimap Notu Sarvas Sarvatra Nandatu May all be happy and healthy. May all see what is good. And may no one experience misery. May all overcome their obstacles and acquire good tendencies. May people everywhere find joy and fulfillment. Let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts. A good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point. That point can be our own breathing. Let us therefore practice breathing with awareness as we breathe in, let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love, strength and compassion. And as we breathe out, let us release all the stress, anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind. Let us practice this way for a while. Let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart. Although God is present everywhere and in everyone, the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our own hearts. We can meditate in any way we have been taught. To remain focused, we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name. Let us now spend some time 
dwelling on the presence of God in our hearts. Om Asatoma Satkamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amrutam Gamaya Aviravir Mayedhi Rudrayate Dakshinam Mukham Tenamam Pahinityam May the Divine lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us. Begin today on verse number 9. Let's chant together. Tirvikalpam anantancha Hetu drishtanta varjitam Aprameyam anadincha Yadnyatva muchate buddha. The enlightened ones become free after knowing one who is without distinctions, infinite, beyond reason and analogy, unknowable as object, and without beginning. So, again, some of the ways, the characteristics of the infinite reality. Um, can be expressed are mentioned in this verse. So the enlightened ones become free. Now, although it says enlightened ones become free, what it really means is that one who becomes free in this way is enlightened. So before, before becoming free, you're not really enlightened, but the way it gets expressed. So don't think that enlightened ones are some special category of people who become free, that all of us are potentially enlightened ones. And so when we become free, that potentiality within us will be manifest fully. But that freedom will come after knowing what are the characteristics of that object. First of all, it is nirvikalpam. There are no distinctions in it. Distinctions can occur in many different ways. First of all, it's the distinction between the one who is trying to know and the one who should be known. So the separation between the devotee and God. So that distinction doesn't exist. But also, in one, the object that we are trying to know itself is has no distinction. For instance now, uh, even though 
every one of us is is one being um we there are distinctions within us i can for instance distinguish my hands my legs my eyes and nose so i'm a one person and yet there are distinctions within that one person so sometimes we might think that the ultimate reality is one but just as there are distinct parts within me there could be distinct parts in that infinite oneness and what this verse says is no there are no distinct parts part of the reason is that the moment you have parts the sum total of the parts can never be infinite so if there are parts and the parts are finite and if the parts make up the whole finite parts can never reach to an infinite thing and therefore you cannot make cannot it cannot have parts secondly if something has parts then it is also breakable i mean if you the moment you have parts the parts can can separate out therefore in 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 brahman in that ultimate reality there are no distinctions there are no parts beyond reason and analogy beyond reason is meant that we cannot no god through reasoning we can have what gets called in vedanta as indirect knowledge we can have intellectual understanding by applying the power of reason but but the actual experience itself uh, cannot come through reasoning in some way we can say this is not only true of the experience of god but really any experience for instance now well experience of ice cream for instance now how can you reason out the experience of ice cream you can probably reason out its its composition uh, uh, the chemical composition you can reason out what kind of things happen when you eat something like an ice cream but, but the experience of ice cream itself is beyond reasoning it's something that's that's too direct it cannot it doesn't go through through the head it's not cerebral so the existence of that ultimate reality is beyond reason the knowledge of that ultimate reality is beyond reason which does not mean that it contradicts reason it just that it is beyond it that's the only idea an analogy you because because the ultimate reality is only one you cannot use simile or metaphors to describe it in fact in in the in devotional um, texts uh, there is a song by a great saint named tulsidas and he is describing in one song he wanted to describe the beauty of rama how how handsome rama's personality was how handsome he was and uh, and so when he began writing that song and so he began to, he just put the first phrase rama's beauty is like and then he started thinking what analogy should i give to describe rama's beauty and then after thinking for a long time he just says rama's beauty is like rama's beauty because you you the moment you say it someone else then you have actually brought down that infinite down to the to the relative plane and that's why uh, you cannot use which doesn't stop us from using analogies but an analogy is is an analogy it's never never an exact replica because sometimes we see in the books the the effulgence uh, of that ultimate being is sometimes we use the metaphor of the sun for instance because that's the brightest object known to us in the solar system that we live and so often times in texts to to describe the the bright effulgence in fact the gita itself um speaks about divi surya sahasrasya that as if thousands of suns if they were to sh- start sh- shining together at once the kind of brilliance you will see that is the kind of brilliance that is uh, connected with god now it's obviously not the brilliance that will blind us but it's the it's the the light the of of consciousness not the not the physical light 
unknowable as object, aprameyam. So, all of our knowledge is really objectification. Uh, to know God, we cannot know God as we know a table or a chair, because God is not the object of our perception. In fact, God is the subject. That's the Vedantic position. That it is, uh, even for me to know a chair to be a chair, I can know that only in and through God. So it's first the light of consciousness that goes out and then removes my ignorance about that object and I know it to be a chair. So I cannot know God as an object, but it's only in and through God that I know all the other objects that I encounter in the world. And without beginning. Without beginning because um, that which has a beginning has an end. So if God had a beginning, then God would have end. And therefore, um, the ultimate reality is seen as beginningless. So that ultimate reality, which is without distinction, infinite, beyond reason and analogy, unknowable as an object, and without beginning, when we know that reality, we become enlightened and we become free. Now, knowledge of that reality is... There are, there are two, two ways of... Two, way, two ways knowledge can come. Um, one is... This is a, suppose I look at the table and I say, this is table. Well, that's knowledge, knowledge of the table. Now, when I know God, the knowledge of God will not be, this is God. Because God is not an object of perception. And therefore, the knowledge of that reality would mean, I am that reality. So, it's a little bit like, If you, if you go to that rope and snake analogy, you mistake a rope um, in a semi-lit room for a snake. Um, and when the light switches on, and then you know it's a rope. Now, oftentimes when we describe that example, give that example, we are standing outside, and we're just looking at the rope, and then we have the rope and snake. Now, think about it this way. Think that you are the rope. You are the rope, and now obviously it's not this external light, it's this internal, internal darkness that you have begun to see yourself as a snake. And, um, and obviously that's ignorance because you're not a snake, you're a rope. Now when you get knowledge, the knowledge that you will have will not be that, oh, that is a rope. It will be like, I'm the rope, right? So in the same way, uh, when you, we encounter that reality, the knowledge will not be, oh, here is this reality. But the knowledge will be, I am that reality. So although the examples that are often given are given in the objective world, we really have to use those examples to look at it in a subjective way. By that I mean, that the real me is, is that ultimate reality. I am Brahman. I am the Atman. But that Atman, my Atman nature is now hidden and I have begun to see myself as a human being. So I am really divine. I am seeing myself as a human. Now when I, when my ignorance goes away and I perceive the divine, I'm going to, my knowledge will be, I am the divine one. My knowledge will not be that, oh, here is the divine in front of me. That is the idea. Verse 10. Na nirodho na chot patir Na baddho na cha sadhakaha Na mumukshur na vai muktaha Ityesha paramarthata. There is no end, no beginning, 
none in bondage, none aspiring for wisdom, no seeker of liberation, and none liberated. This is the absolute truth. So this is oftentimes considered like the last word in Vedanta. And the, and the last phrase is most important. This is the absolute truth. Now, at present, none of this would make sense. Of course there is end. Of course there was a beginning. Of course we feel that bondage. Of course we are aspiring for wisdom. And of course we are seeking that liberation. And of course we would want to be liberated. But this is the relative truth. So we are living in a kind of a Mm, when there is a lot of uh, a, a mist or a fog, then you kind of see things but not very clearly. So our present situation is a little bit like that. That because of this semi-darkness, when the rope got mistaken for a snake, this kind of a semi-darkness of ignorance, the divine is being mistaken for a human being. And therefore... In reality, when this mist will lift, when all the darkness will go away, I will discover that there is really no end, no beginning. That even this one who was seeking after liberation doesn't exist. And liberation itself doesn't make sense when there is no bondage. So there is no bondage and hence there is no liberation. It's a little bit like uh, in your dream, uh, you find yourself in a forest. And then... You're walking all alone, and then suddenly a tiger appears from somewhere. And after a few years, it won't because it's an, almost on the extinction. But right now, there are a few tigers living. And so the tiger is chasing you, and you're running for your life. And it's, it's a life and death situation. You're hectic, and you're just kind of running. And then suddenly, you wake up. Now, when you wake up, you don't worry afterwards, oh, my God. Will the tiger catch up with me? Or what happened to the tiger? Where did the tiger go? Actually, everything has gone. The tiger has disappeared. The forest has disappeared. The chase has disappeared. And everything, nothing remains. And that is the absolute truth. The relative truth was in the dream, you were being chased. You were frightened. It was terrible. But the absolute truth was none of that really existed. That's what is being pointed out here that whatever we are experiencing right now, that is not to be dismissed because as long as we are experiencing it, it's real. But to know that this is not the absolute reality. Just like whatever you are experiencing in the dream, it's real as long as you are dreaming. When you wake up, that's gone. So similarly, we will wake up from this, what we today call the waking state what we call today the world which seems so stable, which seems like, my God, it's been here around for billions of years and looks like uh, it's going to be around for a while. Uh, maybe not. When you become free, all of this just disappears as instantaneously as the dream disappears when you wake up. If you don't want it to disappear, don't get enlightened so soon. That's the only way. It is said, the books say, that once you become enlightened, you're not really totally free. In the sense that, after you become enlightened and you say, oh my God, I, I would like to go back to that world again. Sorry, you can't. So that's why I've said, if you really want to live here longer and enjoy, enjoy what's going on, um, don't be too much in a hurry to be free. Uh, the, the Sanskrit word says that once a person becomes enlightened, whether that person likes it or not, that person is going to be free. You cannot come back. It's a little bit like when you wake up in the morning and after waking up you say, decide, oh my God, that dream, I would like to kind of go back and see uh, kind of for a little while and see what happened afterward. Sorry, you can't go back. So don't wake up if you are enjoying the dream. That's the idea. Verse 11. Eka evatma mantavyo Jagrat swapna sushupti shu Stanatraya vyati tasya 
पुनर्जन्म न विद्यते The Atman should be meditated on as being the same in the states of waking, dream, and deep sleep. Whoever transcends the three states is not born again. So, just take a quick look at what happens in a twenty-four hour cycle. So, a big chunk of it is is what we call the waking state. Now, when we are awake, we encounter the world. Well, right now. so we experience the world um experience all the people in it the place and this place has its own joys and its own problems set of problems that's what we are experiencing right now now then we go home have a good dinner and then go to sleep when we go to sleep dreams we enter a dream world now in the dream world again we'll encounter people we'll encounter again depends on and uh, depends on what kind of dreams you get but that will be a whole different world that we encounter in the dream and you will be observing that world and that world in that world will have its own set of joys own set of problems own set of issues it's it's a whole different world in itself and then every night again there are there's a short time at least a few minutes sometimes much more than that is what we call sushupti the deep sleep state when you are not even dreaming now even when you are not dreaming that doesn't mean you are not experiencing anything we are experiencing at least two things in deep sleep and those two things that we experience are a kind of nothingness a kind of like total nothingness total total darkness if you like just great ignorance and the second thing we experience is actually a great joy um which is why when you have really have some good sleep and you wake up in the morning um you just feel or if you have a friend you might mention it to a friend or you you just know that oh i slept so well i didn't know anything at all maybe it rained very heavily that night and there was thunder and lightning but you were so fast asleep you had no idea so you say my god it happened all this last night i didn't know anything i was fast asleep and i just feel so rested and happy now that expression is what you experienced in sleep so that thing was occurring in the sleep although of course you had no need and no way to express it while you were asleep so even in the deep sleep state while the experience is not as varied as we have in the waking and in the dream state we are still experiencing ignorance a kind of nothingness and experiencing joy so in all of these three states there is something being experienced in the waking state this world in the dream state the dream world in the deep sleep state this nothingness and joy now what this verse points out is that in all of these three states what we experience the object of our experience is different but the one who is experiencing all those three is the same person if it were not the same person you, you wouldn't be able to identify with the dream next day you wouldn't be able to wake up and say oh last night i dreamt like this what it shows is this when you are able to remember the dream what it means the one who dreamt is the same one now who is narrating it it's not a different person so the same person experiences the waking world the dream world and the deep sleep world what this verse points out is that the worlds change the waking experience is different from the dream experience is different from the deep sleep experience but the one who is experiencing it is one and the same the difficulty we have is kathopanishad has one verse which says that the infinite being who created us all the creator kind of hurt us a lot by giving us the senses which are naturally going outward 
And because the natural tendency of our senses is to go out, we are programmed to just accept data from the external world. So all the sights go in me, all the sounds outside go in here, all the smells, everything, all the taste, everything from the external world. And when you have too much information coming from outside, that leaves us no time, leisure, or even energy to just go inside and see what, who is the person who is experiencing it. And so we have kind of become extroverts uh, just because our senses naturally go out. Which is why we tend to focus on the object more than the subject. And if we want to be good students of Vedanta, we'll have to change that. We'll have to focus on the subject. That doesn't mean you ignore the object, but you always know who is the one who is seeing it. And what this verse points out is, if we pay careful attention, not get absorbed, think about it this way, how often in the course of a day Do we just kind of look at ourselves as ourselves? Most of us don't have time to do that. There are so many things to attend to. There is so much work. Oh, I've got to do this. This is my duty. This is my responsibility. These are the people I need to meet. These are the people I need to avoid. That's the place I need to go to. There's so much going on. There is no time to pause and just see who is this person experiencing all this? What does it all mean ultimately? All of this didn't exist for me before I was born. None of this is going to matter or exist for me after I die. And yet, this has kind of taken away, taken over all of my life. And so a subjective thing would be to come back at least now and then to just look at, and that's what mindfulness can help us do. It can prevent us from getting kind of sucked into this um, uh, external flow of unconscious living. It will make us more conscious, kind of bring a little bit more stability to our lives. And so that is what this verse points out, that the more we reflect on the experiences that we have in waking, dream and deep sleep, what we need to remember is that the one who is experiencing the three states is the same although the objects are different. And the more we are able to focus on this one who is experiencing it, the more we are able to transcend the three states because the experiencer transcends the three states. Therefore, it's, it says, whoever transcends the three states is not born again. I would not be aware of the waking world, this world, if I didn't have consciousness, if I fall unconscious, I would have no idea what's going on. So I need consciousness to be aware of this world. I need consciousness to be aware of my dreams. My dreaming self has to be a conscious being. Let's say in my dream, I fall down unconscious. I wouldn't know what's happening there because I'm unconscious. So even in order for me to see my dream, I need consciousness. In order for me to experience the deep sleep state, I need consciousness. So what is common in the experience of the three states is consciousness. And I am that consciousness. That consciousness does not change. But the dream world, the waking world, and the deep sleep world, they change. That is what this verse points out. Verse 12. Eka ye vahi bhutatma, bhute bhute vyavasthitaha, ekadha bahudha chaiva, drishyate jala chandravat. The Atman is one and it is present in every being. Though one, it appears to be many, like the reflections of the moon in water contained in different vessels. 
Now here is this question. So we are now, we, the world that we encounter, we see many beings, living beings, non-living things. And among living beings, again, we have categories. We have human beings, animals, plants. And again, we just keep on creating subcategories. Now, what this verse points out is, let's look at what creates the differences. Obviously, um, and all of us now, for instance, who are present here today, uh, all of us, every one of us has a body. Our bodies are different, that's very obvious. Uh, each of us has a mind. The mind looks different, because if they were same, I would know exactly what's going on in your mind. But only I know what's going on in my mind, you know what's going on in your mind. Uh, it's a closed wall, so our minds seem to be different. Our bodies seem to be different. What about the Atman? Is the Atman different or not? And what this verse points out is, the Atman is really one and the same. But before we go there, um, just keep one other thing in your mind, that although we say our bodies are different, um, recognize that this is also not a fully accurate statement. There is really no, even at the material level, there is really no gap anywhere. If we just look at the entire world created with material particles, you can go to as small a particle as you can think of, maybe atoms, molecules, or electrons, protons, whatever particle you want to go to. All of the objects in the world are just filled with these material particles. Not only our bodies, even the air in the middle. So really, it's this one big ocean of material particle. All that we are doing is a certain group of material particles uh, which seem to have a certain density and which seems to kind of remain um, unchanging compared to the changes that are occurring. And we say, well, this is my body. But of course, we know the body is changing. We, we, we look so different when we were born. And we are, as we grow, our body also grows. Um, also with the food that we eat. So it's, it's a pretty dynamic equilibrium my body has with the material world. And yet, but still, in a relative sense, we can say our bodies are different. Exactly in the same way we can say our minds are different. But the Atman is not different. Because the body and mind, all said and done, are still material things. It's still possible to set boundaries. But the Atman is non-material. It's just pure consciousness. You can't build walls around the Atman. And yet, the Atman seems to look different. And the reason is, as this points out, it appears to be many like the reflection of the moon in water contained in different vessels. And it's an analogy that comes again and again in the tradition. Sri Ramakrishna, in his conversation, you'll find in that book, Gospel of Ramakrishna, he gives the example of the reflection of the sun in, say, 10 jars of water. So there are 10 jars filled with water, and there is the sun shining. And then if someone were to ask you, well, how many suns there are? You might say, well, 10, and the, <laughs> the one original. And then you say, you break one jar. How many now? It's, well, 9 plus 1, 8 plus 1. You keep on breaking them. And ultimately, when you break all the jars, then you say, how many are there? Well, the only one which was there. So, it, and, but the reality is, all along, there was only one sun. But there appeared to be 11 suns uh, because there were 11 containers. So we might say, one of the ways of understanding it is, that the body and mind, especially the mind, um, uh, reflects that consciousness. So that pure consciousness gets reflected in every body and every mind, giving us the impression as if that consciousness... Now, if there are 10 jars, you don't have one-tenth of the moon in everyone. You have a reflection of the full moon in everyone. So similarly, it's this full Atman that gets reflected in every body and mind, making us feel that each of us has an Atman of our own. But in reality, uh, the Atman is only one. So what we experience inside is really the reflection. And the moment this jar, the identity with this jar is transcended, 
we encounter the real Atman. Verse 13. Ghatasam Vritama Kasham Niyamane Ghate Yatha Ghato Niye Tana Kasham Tatha Jeevo Nabho Pamaha When a jar is moved, it is the jar that changes place not the space enclosed in the jar. The individual self, called jiva, is compatible to the space enclosed in body and mind. So again, um, the example is pretty clear and obvious. So what had really happens? When a person dies, um, this is always the question that comes in, in the religious texts, what happens after we die? Um, and oftentimes, at least in, in Vedantic texts, we find, well, after the person, the death really means the death of the physical body. It's a subtle body. The mind, along with the Atman, then goes to different spheres according to one's karma. Now, Atman really is just, it's infinite. Um, and just the space, you can, you can move this. For instance, there is now space inside this. Now, I move this from here to here. Um, can I really say that I have moved the space inside this from one place to another? I really cannot say that. But let's say um, if, if the space in this was, had, was aware, had gotten identified that I am this, if you call this, a, what would you call this object? Bowl. So if this, if this space in it, if you asked, hey, who are you? Oh. I am a bowl space. So if that space had gotten too much identified with it, then when I move it, then this bowl space would have felt, well, I have now moved from one place to another. But in reality, the space is infinite. Nothing really has moved. So similarly, the jiva, the, the atman, which has gotten identified with the body and mind, which is in ignorance, feels then, oh, after death now, I'm going from one place to another. But actually, the, the spirit or the space itself doesn't go anywhere. Verse 14. Ghatavat vividha karam Vidyamanam punaf punaha Tad bhagnam nachajanati Sajana ticha nitya shaha. Like any jar, objects with various forms break down repeatedly. The space enclosed in them is not aware of it, but the Atman is always aware. And what this verse does is because we have been giving the analogy, and we saw earlier that it is beyond analogy, and therefore sometimes analogy can, if not taken correctly, that analogy can create a lot of misunderstanding. So because here now we have compared the Atman to, the, to space, uh, this verse makes it clear that just like a, a, a clay jar, a jar made of, of clay can break down, um, any material objects are prone to breaking down. Well, death is nothing done but the breaking down of the body jar, if you like. But when we compare the Atman to the space, to space, uh, space is, is, an, is, a, is, a, is an analogy. So space itself is not aware, but the Atman is aware. So that's the distinction. So oftentimes they say that when we give an example, that example is meant to show similarity in some aspect. You can never take the example in its totality. Um, Ramakrishna used to say that if, if two people uh, say if someone is very brave or very courageous and fights real hard, so sometimes you can say like, well, this person is a real lion. He's so courageous. He just Now, when, you, when you're not giving an example, you're using a metaphor or a, a simile. Now, what that example is meant to show you, that just like lion is said to be a symbol of strength and courage, this person has that strength and courage. 
But just because you're comparing the person to a lion, obviously, doesn't mean the pers this person has a, has a big mane and a tail and four legs. Obviously, we don't say that. So similarly, whenever an analogy is given, we have to see what that analogy is trying to convey. So when space is given as an analogy to Atman, it's only to convey its all-pervasiveness. But the, obviously, the two are different. The Atman is aware and space is not. Verse 15. Shabdamaya vrito naiva Tamasayati pushkare Bhinne tamasichai katvam Eka eva nupashyati Being covered by Maya, which is a mere sound, the Atman does not know itself due to darkness. When the darkness is eliminated, the Atman is by itself and realizes its oneness with Brahman. Very straightforward, very clear. One phrase is important here, Maya, which is a mere sound. Now what is meant is this. There is a lot of discussion in books about the the connection between the word, the sound, and then the object it seems to represent. For instance now, uh, the word bowl, for instance. So you say, the bowl. Now when I, when I utter the word bowl, I'm, some sound is created, bowl. And then here there is the object, which I call bowl. So the, there is a lot of studies have been done to investigate the connection between the word bowl, the sound bowl, and the object bowl. And different philosophical schools have different things to say about the status of this object. Well, does this object really exist? Uh, or is it merely the meaning conveyed by the object, conveyed by the word. Uh, in fact, in Sanskrit, the, the word for object in Sanskrit is called padartha. It's a combination of two terms, pada plus artha. Pada means word and artha means meaning. So really, any object that we encounter in the world, if you translate it literally in, in Sanskrit or in many Indian languages, it really means a word meaning. What is this object? It's the word meaning of bowl. And so when we say therefore maya, now maya is an object. When I utter the word maya, some sound is created. What is the object that is being referred to? And this verse points out, maya, there is no object. It's simply a sound. Etymologically, the word maya literally means that which is that which is not, that which doesn't exist. And that's why the maya is so mysterious, because that which doesn't exist seems to exist. So that which is impossible, it seems to be possible. And that is why maya is something that makes the ridiculous appear normal. I mean, think about it this way. What could be more ridiculous than this one infinite being who is immortal, free and pure, suddenly has gotten fractured and now has become mortal and has become now filled with problems and mortality and bondage? How? How could just one being suddenly become many? How could the immortal become mortal? How could the free become bound? And the answer is, as we saw in verse number, the earlier verse in uh, number 10, there is no end, no beginning, no bondage, no aspiring. The answer is, no, that never happened. The one being has always been a one being. They say, wait a minute, if one being has always been a one being, what is all this? So, well, it seems to have become like this, but not really. 
I always like to think about this way. In your, let's say you go home tonight, and then you sleep, and then you dream. Now, in your dream, someone comes and tells you, hey, don't take all this seriously, it's only a dream. You're not going to believe that person, I, I guarantee you. You're going to say, this person is, something is wrong with this person. But actually, that person is telling you the truth. That person is coming in your dream and telling you it's a dream, and that person is actually telling you the truth. Now, if I believe that person, then I will, it will be easier for me to remain unaffected by whatever is happening in my dream. And at that person, it turns out the person is true. And when I wake up, I say, well, exactly what I was thinking about, that is exactly what it is. All of it didn't exist. In this dream of the world, the Amrita Bindu is coming and telling us, this is the dream. Now, whether you want to believe it or not, that's the challenge before us. And that's why we need this deep shraddha, the deep faith. Because otherwise, um, <coughs> without faith, it's so easy to, to dismiss it all. I mean, it does look, it does look unbelievable. And now, because many of you have been coming for years and reading this, it's all one, and it's all in one. We kind of have kind of internalized it. It seems to make sense. But if you tell this to some total stranger who has no background and no interest, that it's all one, um, you would be lucky if that person thinks you're not crazy. <laughs> That's what Maya can do. But it has no absolute existence of its own. That is why it is said it is a mere sound. And because, because of that, I do not know myself. Because of that ignorance, I don't know myself. Because, I'm, because of that, I am dreaming, but I don't know I am dreaming. When will I know it was a dream? When I wake up and everything disappears in a moment, I say, oh, that was only a dream. Exactly in the same way, the Upanishad says, we are going to wake up from this dream. If the waking state seems to be more real than the dream, there is something even more real than this waking state. In order to reach that greater reality, I need to let go of this reality. I can't have it both ways. You can't be dreaming, you can't be simultaneously aware of the dream world and the waking world. You can't say, I want to hold on to the dream, yet I want to wake up. No, you can't. If you want to wake up, you have to let go of the dream. So I must have the courage to let go of this dream of the waking world. Now, what does letting go mean here? There's, there's nowhere to run. But wherever you run, the world is still there. Letting go here really means having the courage to kind of look deeply inside our heart. Letting go here means asking some kind of questions which can be frightening at times because it's, it's almost like questioning some of the basic assumptions we have made in life. We know, we know it's, so, it's not easy to change our way of thinking. I mean, it's so, suppose someone, even in politics, if someone holds extremely um, liberal views, uh, it's not so easy to change a liberal to a conservative or vice versa. We now think sometimes changing our physical habits are, is, is difficult. It was more difficult to change our ways of thinking. And it's even more difficult to change our ideas of self-identity, of who we are. <clears throat> because our understanding of the world is very much connected with our understanding of ourselves. And what the Upanishad is asking us is to take a hard look at some of the basic assumptions we have made about ourselves, about the world, about the purpose of life. And then not be afraid to question. It doesn't mean that everything that we have thought about ourselves is wrong. That's not what's intended. Maybe a lot of things we have got it right. But, but we need the courage to examine it. And after examining, we find this makes sense, keep it. If it doesn't make sense, then try to find out what makes greater sense. So that's where courage is required. 
to be able to uh, if we are if we have the quest for truth if we have the quest for knowledge then anywhere any time if we find something is not as true as i thought it was then i must have the courage to say okay if that's not what it was i can let it go because now i have some found something which makes better sense i found something which seems to be a greater truth if you like that's the idea so we'll stop here today um you have any thoughts ideas questions comments mm-hmm. swamji swamji you said that we should go from the objects to subjects and i wanted to understand a little bit the difference between an object and a subject is a subject an object where the self is involved yes it's a little bit like um, a general tendency because because the mind always goes out and we question things um what most people think is you see something um why is that thing that way why shouldn't that be changed that's the way we think if if you don't like something why that is that way that is looking at the object and reacting to it a subjective reaction would be not why that thing is that way why am i seeing it that way so the focus is on the self now this should be done in a mature way because the focus is on the self the idea is not that you have to be selfish or kind of a narcissistic person like a like it's all about me it's it's that's not what i'm saying but 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 mm, in a practical term what we will see is that it's so much easier to change ourselves than to change the rest of the world um when we were children oh, one of the stories they used to tell us was that um um it seemed there was some king in ancient days and there was a lot of dust in the kingdom everywhere and the king was like i've got this i just hate this dust uh so he called and said let's cover the entire kingdom <clears throat> with with leather or cloth or whatever material they could get so that uh, no dust would be visible and then his um uh, advisors then go and then tell him you know that's probably first of all we can't afford it can't cover the entire kingdom with it it's so much easier we just cover our own feet and that's how shoes were invented just cover your own feet so no dust will attach to it now it's kind of a crude example but that's what i see between subjective and objective one is how can i change what's out and a subject would be can i make some change in me by which whatever it is that's troubling me can be can be removed and that's the idea yeah one second uh you, you talked about the dream where it is uh, somebody tells you in the dream that we don't believe but i feel that uh, at least many of us we have an experience that even dreams are not true even while dreaming i know that it is a dream sometimes it happens i think experience why it's not happening in the real world like there well, is some- there is there is no very very diff- why it is so difficult so not, that w- not really that difficult i mean just as you say that sometimes in the dream you know it's a dream uh sometimes i mean that itself is a part of vedanta practice if you can since you now know this that in dream it's possible for you to sometimes know it's a dream why don't you say wake up in the morning and if this this analogy makes sense to you tell yourself this is a dream and hold on to that idea and that doesn't shouldn't stop you from doing whatever is required of you in that dream world you will have your dream duties you will have your dream responsibilities you will have your dream hunger which will be satisfied with dream food all of this is there but you always remember this is a dream it's possible now 
you will forget often, but, but it's still possible to do it. Think about it this way. When you go to see a movie, before the movie starts, you know exactly, well, you know you're going to see a movie, right? Now when the movie begins, if the movie is not particularly a good movie, you will never forget it's a, it's, a, it's a movie. You will probably concentrate more on the popcorn in your hand. Or you will say, oh, when will this get over? I'll, or you will always know it's a movie. But suppose it's a good movie. Great acting, great story, well. And then, sometimes you kind of get sucked into that story. You then start identifying with some characters in it. And if it's really a great movie, you, you might for a while even forget you're watching a movie because you've become part of the story, right? So now, if that's possible for a movie made by human beings, look at this cosmic movie made by God, the producer, director, all like the <laughs> super quality. It's so easy to kind of forget ourselves, right? So try doing it. I think it's, it's a great practice in itself. Morning, remind yourself, this is a 3D movie. And actually, in some sense, this 3D movie is much more interesting than any <laughs> movies that you see. I sometimes say, you don't need Netflix if you can see this world flicks, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's free. It's free. You don't have to even pay. We go and pay to see movies which are not even half as interesting. But the reason we are not able to enjoy this movie is because we have forgotten that we are a part of the audience. We have gotten become a part of the story. So can you see yourself watching the movie and also see yourself as a part of the story? Think about it this way. Uh, let's say there is a, some movie and the actor who has acted in that movie has gone to see that movie. Okay? So that actor now, who is acting in that movie, is seeing him or her in, on the screen, but also knows I'm watching the movie. It's possible, right? So similarly, you, the real you, is watching this cosmic movie of the world. The dream you, the apparent you, is acting in that movie. So enjoy the movie of the world, and when you see yourself, you say, well, I played that role. I'm, so, none of us is a human being trying to be divine. We are actually divine beings playing the role of human beings. So remember you are divine, watch this drama of the world, and see yourself playing the role of a human being. Now, uh, as I said, um, you might be able to hold this thought for a few minutes, then later on you may forget, but don't get too upset if you forget. Again, in the course of the day, so you suddenly remember, you again will say, okay, I'm going to now remember. Maybe again you will forget. But this itself can be, because none of us can sit and meditate whole day because we have other things to do. But this is something that can be done throughout the day without it encroaching upon your duties and responsibilities. So you can carry out all your duties, all your responsibilities, and somewhere in the corner of your heart, you say, it's a great movie. If we can do that, we'll be able to handle the ups and downs of life in a much, much mature way. We'll be able to keep our balance. We will not get overwhelmed by these big tsunamis that come now and then in our lives. Swamiji, the verses 13 and 14 where uh, you talked about the analogy of the jar and the space, mm -hmm. would you be able to elaborate a little bit more about uh, what the space means in the jar? Yeah, so the idea is <clears throat> uh, uh, probably water, water might, let's, let's think, take the example of water if you like. So if, if, if I now, 10 people go to a lake and with 10 different containers with different sizes and different shapes and 
immerse their containers in the water of the lake. So now, uh, and don't take it out. Just let your containers remain immersed in it. Now, the water is water. Uh, before the containers were there, if that water could speak, and you ask them, well, hey, who are you? And say, well, I'm lake water. Now that, yeah, you, let's say I've gone and immersed my bowl inside that water. And then I look inside the water in this bowl and say, hey, who are you? And say, I'm bowl water. And then I say, but what about that water other, outside you? Well, that's lake water. That's so big. I'm so tiny. You see? But really, if I move this bowl inside the body of the water, nothing really has changed because the water is the same. But if that water continues to get identified with this, it will still think I'm the bowl water. That's the idea. So we are that infinite spirit, now kind of enclosed in this body and mind. And that's why if someone were to ask me who I am, I don't say I'm the lake water, because that would be like I am Brahman. I say, well, I am this so-and-so. I am Mr. and Mrs. or whatever, I am so-and-so. That's because I've gotten identified with this container. <clears throat> yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, Swamiji, uh, verse 11 talks about uh, the meditating, the Atman should be meditated on as being same in the states of, the three states. <coughs> so my question is, and then it says, whoever transcends, so the whoever is human beings they're talking about. But what part of us is transcending these states? Is the, clearly, it's not the body. Is it the mind? Are we, is, as, as I understand it, we, it's saying that we have to be aware that it's the same observer in all the three states. So what part of us is really going to transcend these three states? And can we actively... But the spirit, the thing is this. <clears throat> the body that I... The body that experiences the dream is a different body. Because the body that is experiencing the waking world is actually asleep in the bed. And my dreaming self, actually, it may be running about in, in Bahamas in the dream. So now that body, obviously, the dream body is different from the waking body. The waking body is just asleep. So the body is different. Uh, the mind is different. Uh, but the consciousness which is experiencing the waking world and the dream world, that consciousness is not different. There is nothing to distinguish consciousness, but it's possible to distinguish the body and mind. And so what remains unchanged is the, the consciousness that is needed to experience the three states. Most of us, most of the time, are focused on the objects of consciousness. And what the Upanishad is saying is forget about the objects, they'll keep on changing. Every state, there is a waking world, dream world, objects will keep on changing. But the one who is perceiving the objects, consciousness, that remains constant. And that consciousness transcends the three states. So that consciousness transcends the three states to realize or to become the Atman? No, or it is the Atman. You are that. You are that transcendent consciousness. So it just finds itself. You or find yourself. Right now, I am that transcendent consciousness, but if I become identified with what I see in the waking world, then I have become this waking self. If I become identified with what I see in the dream world, I become the dream self. So my true identity is clouded, is covered, because of my identification with the objects. The moment I give up that identification, then I just, my consciousness goes inside, inward, and I know who I am. So so that's why a practice in Vedanta is to look at everything from a subjective standpoint. Not why things are out there the way they are, but why I am seeing it that way. That's why. <coughs> So
Swamiji, then what consciousness we are talking about? Because consciousness is pure. So is, we have lower consciousness and... Um, well, consciousness, but pure is meant... There is, there is consciousness itself and consciousness of objects. It's like, um, it's like uh, light, for instance. None of us can see light, but we can see objects illumined by light. Light itself can never be seen. And so consciousness, what most of the time when we use the word consciousness, we are using it in, a, in an objective sense, consciousness of something. Uh, pure consciousness means consciousness itself. So the analogy would be just as objects illumined by light and light itself. Light itself can't be seen. So what we are now experiencing are objects because we are conscious of them. So now we go to consciousness itself. What would be consciousness if there were no objects to be conscious of? What would be light if there were no objects to be illumined? Would the sun stop shining if there was nothing needing sun's light? That's the idea. So right now we are conscious about mind, body, but not the consciousness of Atman. Yes. So, yes. So because the senses go outward, I become aware of the object of consciousness. Now, if I'm able to detach myself from the objects of consciousness, then I will be able to turn inward. Ramakrishna gives the example of, a, uh, to put it in, uh, in more contemporary terms, if on a dark night, a new moon night, and everything is pitch dark, there's no lights at all, and I'm going with a flashlight. Now, with the help of the flashlight, uh, I'm able to see the road and I'm able to walk. Now, the person coming from the opposite side um, is able to see the road also by the light that I'm flashing. But that person cannot see me. Now, if that person has to see me, that person will say, can you please turn the flashlight toward your face so that I can see you? Now, our problem is this. All of our power of consciousness, if you like, if you want to call it that way, is kind of going outward. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the world. I'm seeing the world. Now, what meditation really means is saying, don't think of the world. You close your eyes, close everything. In effect, I'm trying to make my consciousness take a U-turn. And I can stop looking at the world for a while, look at myself. And then the, 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 the the illumination, the effulgence, the light, if you like, of what we see in the heart is really our own consciousness taking a U-turn. But because it has gotten so used to, it's almost like um, um, if, 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 if you have any, I'm not able to think of an example right now, but it's like um, if, if, there is, if there is some gadget you have which can turn, say, upon its hinges, but you have never used those hinges for, say, last 500 years. <laughs> and then suddenly you say, oh, let me turn it. It's going to be very difficult. You need to little um, oil it, do some lubricate it, and kind of gradually make it turn, turn it. That's, that's kind of a very crude example, but it's a little bit like this. We have gotten so far, not just in this life, life after life, God knows for how many millions of lives, we have always been kind of looking outward. And then when we take spiritual life seriously, we are told now, look inward, look in your heart. But we haven't done it for a long time. And so that's why it becomes very difficult. But it's not impossible. It needs persistence, it needs practice, and then gradually, even if temporarily, we are able to say, okay, for the next few minutes at least, let me prevent my mind from going out. Let me prevent my eyes, my ears from going out. Let me all kind of turn it inward and see what is going on here. Now, that is what meditation really means. Yeah. Okay, so we'll stop here today. And when we begin next time, that will be on verse 16. 
ओम जननी सारता देवी रामकृष्ण जगद्गु पादपद्मे तयो श्रीवा प्रणमा मुहुर्मुहु on sunday for the satsang our subject will be creative imagination that we'll do it on sunday uh, next uh, wednesday we will not have the upanishad class and so we will meet uh, today is what 10 17th no. T- today is 12th so 19th uh, so when will be the next gita will be on 24 25 26th 26th okay so next uh, uh, upanishad class will be on 26th so of two weeks from today and uh, the sunday i already mentioned and then tuesday and saturday our aarti and meditation will continue as usual so i'll conclude with the prayer now on page 3 May the divine being who is the father in heaven of the Christians holy one of the Jewish faith Allah of the Muslims Buddha of the Buddhists Tao of the Taoists our Amasta of the Zoroastrians the great spirit of the native Americans and Brahman of the Hindus lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light from death to immortality may we be granted strength freedom and clear understanding may we learn to see god in our own hearts and in everyone around us may god bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude grace and love om shanti 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 hi peace 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 be unto you